Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Stickler for the Details. My name is Alan Dickerson, otherwise known as Stickler in some circles, and I'm going to continue with my three days of Gettysburg playthrough, where I'm trying to get as far into the first day, July 1st, 1863 as is possible and let's see um i'm not going to announce this ahead of time so i'm actually not expecting too many people to drop in maybe youtube will alert subscribers to my channel that i am broadcasting currently and maybe people will wander in but i'm not expecting that i will be checking the comments though periodically to see if Anyone drops in and has any questions? Uh, let's see. Let's kind of get everybody caught up as to where we are. We are in which turn? We are in the 11 o'clock hour on the first day of uh, July 1863. And if you know your Gettysburg history, you know that the battle begins with Buford's Union Cavalry right here, facing off against Heath's division, which enters here. So Heath has, in fact, entered, hasn't done much, got a couple of his units uh, shot up from uh, this brigade. Is it Jones? or From Archer's brigade. They got shot up a little bit. Um, the Union are in very good shape, and also elements of the First Corps are streaming up the road here, up the Chambersburg Pike, I believe that is, towards Gettysburg and through Gettysburg. Lead elements have reached the right flank of the Evolving Union position. This is Wadsworth's division. And to the south, we also have Doubleday's division, which entered very early on the first turn, in fact, and is moving into this position here. Also, we have the first elements of 11th Corps, at least the uh, artillery of which have arrived just off of Cemetery Hill with the infantry about a mile and a half further back in tow. So the Union uh, position is starting to form, and the Confederates are preparing for more reinforcements to enter here on the north map edge west of Oak Hill to begin to possibly flank the Union position. So with that in mind, we are, we're about halfway through, third of the way through the 11 o'clock turn. In fact, uh, Wadsworth's division here has drawn two activations already here. And Buford has basically gotten uh, three activations in which they really did not do much. So he's used a bunch of activations, so we won't be expecting a lot more action from him for the rest of the turn. For the Confederates, we have Pender, who are... Uh, the first reinforcements for AP Hill's Corps come in behind Heath, who has not activated yet this turn. So that's kind of where we are. So we don't have, uh, I don't believe we have had either March Chit come out of the hat yet. Hang on, let me check. No, the Confederates have not. The Union, I believe, did have its march should come out, although this may be a holdover from earlier, so we will see. 
All right, so let's go and draw a chit out, and we get Heath Division, his first activation. Let me move this back out of the way and figure out what Heath's division is going to do. Okay, last turn to, to end the turn, we kind of moved Archer's somewhat battered brigade off to the side and they're also the troops are not of great quality fours and fives for um efficiency and so we've kind of moved them off and i might decide later with a lot of forces coming on to maybe even put them in reserve for a turn and see if we can't um recover stragglers and uh Restore this one collapsed unit here. Which one is it? This one is on the cusp. There's one unit that only has, yeah, this one here is collapsed. So I might even at some point uh, put that unit in reserve and see if I can freshen it for the afternoon. In the meantime, we've gotten the shock troops, I guess, for Heath's division um, toward the front here, Pettigrew. And as you can see, all of these are huge regiments, uh, 550 and one 600 man regiment here. And they are at the base of this uh, southern most part of hers ridge this is all kind of part of the same formation here and is the first ridge that the union um, are tasked with defending also down here we've had davis who had the unfortunate um, occurrence that he was in attack orders and contemplating making a flank attack through the trees here and he tried to change his own orders and rolled a loose cannon and being a cautious commander that he is davis dropped back into advance and had his guys take one big step backward so he's not in really good shape but let's see what we're going to do so we've got these three brigades davis pettigrew and archer we have Heath himself here on the road with AP Hill stacked with him. Heath's radius is four movement points. And so that puts uh, Archer. Hang on. Let me see if this is a swamp hex. It is. So that would be two, three, four. Well, let's see. One and a half, two and a half, three and a half. So Archer is in command. Um, Broken Bro is in command, but I believe Davis is out of that range. One, two, three, four. So he is still out of command and cannot um, cannot actually even use all of the activations for Heath's division this turn in fact he's going to have to sit out one but i don't think it's going to be this one uh to begin with we've got pettigrew already in attack he's going to try and move up here and see if he can't uh start to knock these mounted cavalry off of the the ridge would be nice to have davis um changes orders back to attack and and uh move in on the side um i can't really see any benefit in attempting to coordinate or attempt to move more than one brigade during the activation so i will eschew that and i will start simply with davis attempting to change his own orders by himself. So he will attempt to change his own orders to attack. So we'll roll on. Let's see here. Oh, 
We'll roll here on the order change table. And we roll an eight, which is successful. So Davis changes over to attack orders. That's a, a good sign for the Confederates. I'll move this back out of the way. And now let's see. Actually, I think I will even start with Davis, seeing as he's doing what I kind of want him to. I will start with this extended line brigade, and I will move them one, and then three. So we pay two movement points for the right half of this extended line to enter the woods. We always pay the most expensive one of the two hexes if they differ. And also being under attack orders, units have only half of their movement allowance, which is normally six, but it is half to three. And we have the ability here to direct some fire and i believe we're going to direct it hmm, at this unit here let's check line of sight first there's no doubt here that and he can make it a range of three, but there is a doubt as to whether this line of sight is valid because of the intervening part of the hill here. So we see that these are adjacent levels of terrain, so we can make it a pretty easy calculation by calling this level one and this level two. So we have level one. And we have level two, which add up to level three. If you divide that in half, you get one and a half. And so any terrain that is higher than one and a half and closer to the lower unit will block. So we have a hex of two level terrain here actually two of them right there in front but they are closer to the higher unit than the lower so that would not block and let's see it doesn't go into this hex so they can see it so they can fire from both of these hexes at that unit they can combine their fire and get all 10 strength points firing and that is exactly what they're going to do so let's bring our charts back here and move to the range effects. And whoops, actually, we, the action's over here. Let's make this a little bit smaller. 75, make it smaller and off to the side. There we go. Okay, this unit is armed with rifles. We have a range of three. And so rifles at range three have a negative two range attenuation. We have uh, a unit that is on horseback, which presents a bigger target. So there's a plus one for that. Oh, hold on. Hold on a second. Let me also note that as this unit moves to within three hexes, these units are eligible if they want to back up and use cavalry, mounted cavalry reaction movement. And I think since they are actually planning to skedaddle, Anyway, they would take that. So they will retreat down the hill. And then they also have to take a UDDs for doing that. 
would be a seven for this unit. He rolls an eight, so he's actually disordered. This unit rolls and gets a three, so he's fine. However, because he has now moved, let me hide the behind that hill, he can't be fired on. So this unit is done for its movement. Then we will move this unit here. And two, three, and then Davis will, hmm, I think he wants to take a central position. He will go one, three, five. He'll move into the woods there out of sight, but within a range of his charges. And then this unit will start to make its way through the woods. That's one and three to move into the woods. There we are. So Davis is finished with his activation. There's no combat. So now we're going to move on and see who goes next. Um, Hmm. Question is whether I want Pettigrew to move up. He is another brigade of units that have not ideal uh, cohesion values. They're all fours, so they are pretty bad troops. So if they were to move up there onto this ridge here, What's the name of this ridge? Uh, Schoolhouse Ridge. If they move up there, they're probably going to get shelled by this artillery. But we got to start to put some pressure on at some point. So they'll move up here. And they're not close enough to this artillery unit to draw approach fire. So. That's uh, one, two, the orchards do not uh, cost anything to start to oops, change facing there. Two, and then three. I'm gonna cozy on along this hill. And make it four. And Union Battery is going to hold their fire at this point. And this unit is going to go there. And their brigade mates are going to come over the crest to three, four, and let's check line of sight here, to see if they have a shot. As you can see, they're kind of nestled in here. There's higher terrain there. So let's check and see if there's line of sight from here to there. All right, this would be terrain level one. This would be terrain level two. This would be terrain level three. So we have one and three, which equal four. Divided by two is two. So two is the potential blocking terrain. These are level two or higher than level two will block, um, will block fire. So this hex is closer than this hex, so they are shielded. Can't be seen. So that's uh, one, two, three. And then they're going to pop up here. And there they will certainly draw fire. Um, the guns elect 
to only fire three of their guns because they anticipate that this unit is going to come up here and they want to be able to fire, approach fire at them. So they're only going to fire three of their guns. Let's bring our charts and tables back. These are three inch rifles at a range of three. The attenuation is plus one. Uh, this would be small arms fire because they're within canister range, but they can still get a plunging fire bonus. So that adds another one. So it's a total of plus two to the die roll. We roll on the small arms table because of the canister. And we have three guns. So we fire on the two to three table. Let's see what the dice tell us. We have three, which when you add two becomes five. And the result of that is a lowercase d or a disorder check for this unit. Let's roll for that first. We get a zero, so they pass the UDD. However, you'll also note that the five result has these little asterisks next to it. And this unit has expended a bunch of ammo. And they will uh, get, where is it? Oh my goodness. I don't see approach fire, return fire. Wow. I don't see a mark for artillery units to have ammo depletion. So let's see if I have an ammo depletion marker here. I don't think I do. Hmm. Don't know why I left that off there. Well, we're going to need something to fill in for an ammo depletion marker. Let's have another look at that again. Should be in the firing menu, but it is not. Approach fire, yeah. It's collapsed out of command. Well, then we will have to use a notes marker let's clone this one and we will change the label to read negative two all right Okay, and moving on, these guys will also move up two, three, four, five, and now the other three guns will fire. And as we know, they have a plus two, but they're also now ammo depleted, so they suffer the effects of the other three guns using more than their share, and so that results in a unmodified die roll on the three table, and we roll. A three. The result of that will be a D minus two. So we roll for the UDD and a two minus two is a zero, so they pass. So they are in really good shape. Broken Bro is going to move this unit up here. One, two, three, four. Five and underneath or behind that unit, and then Broken Bro himself is going to move up here, stay behind the troops, and monitor the situation. So, Broken Bro is done. Archer, I think we are actually going to nestle them in this little area here out of sight, and later I'm going to put them in reserve and lick their wounds 
two, three, four, three, four. Oops, there we go. They'll go there. This unit can rotate and get in there with this unit. There. I'm not going to bother to do all the rotations and all of that, but suffice it to say they can make it. And oh, pop in there on top of that unit. So now they're moved out of the way. And now finally we have Pettigrew. So he's going to try and do some damage here. So they're they're just going to rush up willy-nilly. And here, one. And again, they are within line of sight of the entire row of uh, Union cavalry, which has already decided that they're going to skedaddle. So once they get there, this unit will use the it advance or the retreat rules to go back to two, take a UDD and pass it. Uh, one, this unit will also retreat two hexes and take a UDD and pass it. Okay, then gamble. One, two, three, they have not been approached closely enough, so they will stay there. All right, so that's one. Then they'll move two, and they will stay there, or Buford will not retreat. This unit will, one, two, three, they're fine. They'll, they'll stay there. Then this unit will move here. Now this unit is close enough, but he is the flank of the artillery unit. And he's going to stay there. This unit with Buford, basically his bodyguards are not going to move. This unit will now elect to fire at this unit. So seven strength points can fire out of one hex. So that's seven strength points at a range of two. I already know that rifles uh, have a plus one at range one or two. No prepared fire since the unit has moved. We have a mounted target and he's not in any type of terrain. So that's going to be a total of plus two, one for the rifles, one for the mounted target, seven strength points. Ah, rather poor roll of one, which becomes a three. And that is a straight D result. That unit has a seven cohesion and he passes. Um, let's see, return fire, they have B for breach load. Let's see. They can return fire if they want. And let's see what the range of attenuation tells us for breach load carbines. It says they also have a plus one. So that's what they'll do. They'll return fire with six strength points, plus one for the breach loaders, minus one for firing while mounted. That results in a zero. And prepared fire for breach carbines is only to an adjacent hex, so they don't get that. So they have six strength points and zero modifier. They roll a four. On a six is a straight D against a seven cohesion. He rolls a one and they pass. 
So that is the epitome of desultory fire. Not to be outdone, more units move up and over onto Schoolhouse Ridge. One, two, and then three. This unit under Gamble will reaction move. And because Gamble is there and the unit has an A cohesion, he cannot fail his uh, check. Uh, does Buford want to try to skedaddle? Uh, yeah, there's no sense in Buford staying there. So they will retreat here on top of this unit. But wait, no, they can't do that. That unit is from a different brigade and cannot stack. So they will, okay. So what will happen is they'll have to kind of keep going. And this unit here in front will have to endure another UDD for having a unit jostle its way through. However, since Buford would be in the hex when it makes that uh, UDD and reduces the die roll by two, combined with an A cohesion, it couldn't fail that anyway. Also, the unit that is retreating has a seven cohesion and is with Buford and cannot fail either. Uh, this unit will do the same and he will go through Gamble's unit but you'll notice he has a five cohesion that unit is not oh he's also disordered hmm. Hmm. no that unit's gonna stay there okay so this unit has moved up, sees this unit, and will fire at it and see if he can get some losses here as they go. So range three with rifles is, for attenuation, I believe, a negative two. See, rifles at a range of three is indeed negative two. However, we have flanking fire which reduces or adds one. We also have a mounted target, which adds another. So the range is offset by the tactical situation. So we have seven strength points for this unit firing out of the hex against with uh, no modifiers. And let's roll the die and see what we get. Ooh, a seven. That should be a telling shot. And that is a automatic or uppercase D for disorder. This unit is already disordered. So that means that it automatically takes a strength point loss and must retreat one or two hexes. Hello. Come on. There we go. And... Hate it to match the facing. Whoops. Put that underneath. And they again are going to have to jostle their way through. And that unit cannot fail that UDD. And there they go. Okay. Pettigrew is seeing that he's having some success, so not to be outdone. He's going to move this unit here. He's going to crest the hill here. And this hex is... Hmm. This hex here will block the line of sight to the this unit there, I believe. Let's trace the line of sight. No, it does not hit this hex. It only goes through this. And it's far enough away. 
to where he has line of sight there. However, this unit can elect to retreat and reaction move, and that's exactly what he will do here. He'll roll a UDD 7. He passes. This unit still has one strength point left, and he will use it to move. Hang on. Let's see if this unit on a gamble will elect to keep retreating. I believe he will. He'll duck down there. Let's get these units out of the way. Yep down below the crest, and now when he gets there, these units are now hidden from the view, I believe. Well, maybe not. If we go there, we have this level is one, this level is two, this level is three. So three and one is four, divided by two is two, so two is the potential blocking terrain. These are level two hexes. There we go. So this would be blocking terrain if it is closer to the lower than the higher, which it is. So he is blocked in that little little dale there. All right. Finally, this unit is going to move up one, two, three. Pettigrew will move up presumably to keep this unit still within his command radius, which is a, oh, which is four. So he's fine. And now Pettigrew is finished. Let's see what we're going to do with Heath. Um, Heath is going to move up the road and let's see maybe if he can Hmm. Where to put him? Uh, I probably want to keep him on the road. But eventually, I want to put Davis back in command. We'll put him here. Of course, that's going to put Archer and Broken Bro out of command. But Heath seems to have his issues. So there's really not much we can do about it. That's where he's going to go. Okay. So that activation is now done. And we will move the activation here and bring back our hat. Pick the next chit, and it is Pender, who activates for a fourth time. He, Pender, as we can see, has already incurred a level of fatigue and doesn't want to overdo it, so I think he is going to, whoops, wrong one. Wrong sheet. He's going to eschew that activation, skip it, and we're going to ignore that and pick the next. And here we have Wadsworth. And we're going to have another one of those decisions for Wadsworth because he has already had two activations. A third would mean a level of fatigue for Wadsworth. Let's see what the risk-reward situation is. So here's Wadsworth. Here is Meredith's brigade. Here is Cutler's brigade. Here is the artillery, which do not fatigue, so they can actually use this activation. 
And do we have a third brigade? It's the first division. These units down here, that's a different division altogether for double day. Uh, what else have we got? Ah, and this division, that's a second division. So I'm assuming then that good old Wadsworth only has two brigades. Let me check and make sure that I'm not missing something. Uh, this is first core Wadsworth's brigades, and there are, in fact, two. Okay, so I'm not missing anything. Let's decide what we're going to do. Um, we can already hear the tramp of some troops behind these ridges. So we want to be in position to meet them. We're going to want Cutler to spell uh, Buford. And, hmm, thinking it might be worth it for Wadsworth to incur the level of fatigue to solidify their position. So that is, in fact, what they're going to do. So I will... There we go. Add a level of fatigue to each of these. I like to show it. Come on. Show hide. There we go. So they will each have, actually, they should be under OK fatigue. I have forgotten to add OK fatigue to these banners. So that's something I'm going to have to remember. In fact, let's do that. Let's clone that. Change the label to OK Teak. And keep it with Wadsworth. All right. All right. Let's see. Uh, now, these ridges here are running perpendicular to the front we're trying to establish. So I don't want to position myself on these ridges and present a flank to the on rushing cloud of dust that we can see in here. Uh, let's see. It's looking like this would be a good blocking position. We don't want those units to be able to use much of the road. So we could think about occupying this crossroad and making them move us off of it, but. They can quickly come in behind that position. Let's see what those fens and bogs and swamps mean for the purposes of, say, shock combat. Uh, marshes have no effect on shock. They All they do really is slow movement. So I can kind of use it as a impediment to my flank. <laughs> Hang on a second. So needless to say, units moving into that swamp will probably be stopped 
as soon as they enter it because in attack orders they'll only have three movement points so it might be good to kind of use this as part of the line and i think that's what we're going to do so we're going to move this unit one two three four five six we're going to move this unit let's see i may have it was facing this way uh, okay um let's move this unit first there keep things as uncomplicated as possible one two and of course these facing changes are free three and then they will extend a line into the bog and that will cost two or for a total of five that to reflect a union line oh great uh, we have another little problem there with these units let me try a refresh Let's see what happens here uh, well Nothing to be done about it. Now let's go back down to this unit. One, to rotate two vertices. Three, four, five, oops. Actually, he's going to end up there on the road. It's the best place for him. And then this unit, it's a pretty big brigade. We'll move one, two, three, four, five. Artillery, which can be attached to this division and in fact is uh let's see well right actually right here is still a good position unless he wants to go there but then no nope, he's in a good position there all right this brigade is going to Hmm. have to do this delicately. There's going to be a lot of horse moving uh, backwards to disengage. So we're going to have to kind of leave some gaps, but not leave the road wide open for the Confederates. So one, two, three, four... Willoughby's run is a creek, and that costs plus one to cross stream. Is plus one. Hmm. I gotta check the terrain key on this to make sure that I know what kind of terrain I'm dealing with. Where is the terrain key? Um, down at the bottom here. It is a stream. 
that's what I'm trying to cross there. Creeks are the very dark blue. The runs, which really have no effect, are not running along hex sides and are lighter blue. So that is a stream where I'm trying to cross. The effect of a stream is plus one. Okay, stash that. Let's see, it was here one, two, three, four, five, six, and facing. Here, make sure orchards only cost one. One, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six, and basically one, two, three, four, five. Let's move him there. Cutler will stay kind of in trail there. And now. See, hmm. This artillery here, I had moved them up with. No, they actually they are. They should be attached to the first division also. However, they are, and I will mark them out of command. So they're going to have to sit out at least one activation. They haven't done anything this turn, so they could have sat out either of their previous activations. Now they leave have a shot at these units here on the top from where they are. Let's see here. Let's hide that and check line of sights from here to there. That's basically the same terrain level. So these lower intervening trains are not going to block their line of sight. They are far enough away from intervening units so as not to cause any problems firing over them. Uh, keep in mind that you also have to uh, obey that two hex buffer behind or beyond any units that you're attempting to fire at and if there are any friendly units behind them that will stop you from firing but that is not the case here so we've got these really really large blocks of men here and they make for an inviting target so let's see what we can do to break them up a little bit we have here six three inch rifles six napoleons and over here six napoleons Leave Napoleons are range limited to about eight. So I don't think they're going to be within range. Let's have a look at the range attenuation for Napoleons. No, they have a range of 14. And. Anywhere from 8 to 11 is minus 1. Anything from 12 to 14 is a minus 3. Let's check the TB 3-inch rifles while we're here. Up to 12 or up to 11, they're also negative 1. Minus 2, it ranges 12 to 18. So let's get our handy-dandy line of sight tool and trace that and we find it is indeed exactly range 12. let's see if that isn't any closer that's also range 12. we could fire at this large unit here and he is in the lead 
and get a better shot at range 10. Uh, far enough over the head of Gamble's men. Yeah, let's see what we can do here. However, that is actually is that higher terrain. It is higher, so we wouldn't get a plunging fire bonus, but then we wouldn't over here either. That's the same terrain level. Let's take this shot. So we have at range 10, minus 1 for all the guns that we have available here. And we have a total of 12 guns with a minus 1 for range and a plus one for a large target. So that would just be 12 guns firing on the bombardment table with no modifier. And here we go. Here's the artillery table. 12 guns over here. And we roll the die and we get a five. Oh, great. So we have a 12 guns, let me shorten this up so I can see the numbers. The five is a D plus one, but it also means ammo depletion for both of these guns. So I'll borrow the ammo depletion from this battery, we can see that the Union artillery are kind of being spendthrifts with regards to ammo. Okay, D plus one for this unit, which has a seven cohesion, so he has to roll um, six or lower to pass. He rolls a two, so he passes. And Neighboring are only six guns, so they will fire with the same shot of no modifiers, but only on the six table or the six column, and they roll a three, which becomes a four, right? Hang on. Oh, right. No modifier. So it becomes a three with six guns. One, two, three is a D minus one. So coupled with a seven cohesion, he can only fail on a nine. It doesn't roll that either. Okay. Some more ineffective fire from those guns. And now this division of the Union is done after I figure out what to do with Wadsworth. Does he want to move? Um, Corps Commander is Reynolds here. He might want a more central position so he can keep Cutler in command as well as Meredith. Uh, it's going to be that's going to be kind of difficult to do. However, they do anticipate probably having to abandon this position pretty quickly. Two, three, four, five. Yeah, he's not going to be able to command both of these units easily. Um, so which is more important? These guys, it's a huge brigade. They've got terrific cohesion. Uh, they... They're probably good left to their own devices. So Wadsworth is going to move closer here to Cutler. One, two, three, four, five. Still not close enough. Hmm. One, two, three, four, five. If he moves here, one, two, three, four, five. Still doesn't make it. Hmm. Well, Reynolds will be able to reposition himself during the leader movement phase, so... Uh, 
Let's move them here. Okay. That is now done. So we'll move Wadsworth in here. Stow that. And pick another chit. And it's Wadsworth again. He's going to ignore that one. And we pick it again. We finally get double day. All right. Double day division is down here. And let me check my comments, see if anyone's popped in. Ah, John Longshore. Welcome, John. Glad to see you here. Put in any comments or questions as as they arise, and I'll check back here and see how you're doing. Okay. Let me zoom out my map a teeny bit so we can see kind of where Doubleday's division is it's in relation to the rest of the troops. And this is where we just were with Wadsworth's division here, now forming or trying to form the northern mar northernmost part of the Union line. These guys are coming along this road, and it would probably help for them to come up on the left of Cutler here. So that's what they're going to do. They've already dropped out of march orders and are now assumed to be in advance orders. And the first result of that is all these extended column markers can go away. And they'll be able to bunch up as they move. Okay. See what we got. Would have started there. Because as they move out of March, they now have to face a hex juncture rather than a hex side. So let's make it there. And there's always face north-south. Okay. Start with this unit here. We will move one two the road negates the stream three four and through the orchard grabbing some apples along the way. Okay, and then we'll move this unit. One, two, three, four, five, six. I still don't have him quite facing. There we go. This unit will move one, two, three, four, five, six, and the brigadier with ten movement points at his disposal can easily move there. Now, you'll notice that I haven't moved Doubleday, the division commander, because you usually move them either at the end of all the brigade's movement, or you might want to use him for rallies. So you might move him somewhere in the middle of the turn to help with rallies. But you tend not to move your division leaders right away, because you want them to end 
end up in a position that's uh, best for tracing command and all those sort of things at the end of the turn and at the end of each activation. All right, this brigade one, two, three, four, five, six, One, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, the road negates the woods. Three, four, five, six. We'll move him there. And the artillery. Uh, they're, they're probably going to want to move behind that. So let's see. They move along the road. One, two, three, four, five. And then. Clear terrain costs them two movement points, so that would be seven. A leader goes to the head of the pack, and Double Day. Hmm, I don't know if he's going to be able to move close enough to where Reynolds will end up at the end of the turn. But we'll move him there for now. And there's Double Day. So we will move that shit here, double day, and get the next chit, and it's going to be double day. Starting to see a trend here. I'm wondering why my hat doesn't seem to be randomizing. It seems to be kind of following script for how I dragged everything in there. Double day, second activation, and he will use this to good effect. Okay, we will start with Stone's Brigade. One, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six. And then repositioning so as not to present a flank to the enemy. And the trailing unit. One, two, three, four, five, six. Stone will go there. And we have. The Rowley Brigade, one, two, three, four, five, six, one, two, three, four, five, six. I'll go in down the swale, Brigadier there, and Doubleday himself, who has a radius of five. He's got a great radius, so. You should be able to make the road. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. He'll go there. One, two, three, four, five, six. Oh, his radius is only five, so let's not get carried away. One, two, three, four, five. There we go. Here's Double Day. 
mark them as unmoved, then we can put the used chit there. Bring the hat back. Now we have the Confederate March chit. Now it comes out. All right, do we still have anyone in March? The Confederates do not have anyone in March left, and I don't believe that they have any reinforcements this turn. Pender was the reinforcement, and he's already come on. So, no. No one is in March for the Confederates, so we can safely ignore that shit, and we can move it there and draw the next shit, and it's Heath. This will be a second activation for Heath. And he is very glad to have it. Let's get to working on this cavalry and see if we can do a little more damage before they leave. I'll zoom in a little bit more so we can see what's going on. First, take a look at our command situation. And we find that Heath is here. Pettigrew is within range. Davis is within range. However, Broken Bro, one, two, three, four, is not. Broken Bro is out, and then, of course, so is Archer. Okay, do we want to try to coordinate the attack? Because we have these two brig uh, brigades here in attack. Well, we can kind of read the handwriting on the wall that the Buford Cavalry are not going to put up much resistance and they're going to just retreat. So there's no sense in trying to overwhelm them and risk confusion by trying to combine brigades. So that won't happen. Uh, we'll leave both of these in attack orders. And what the heck, with Broken Bro, we're going to attempt to have him change his own orders to attack. He makes no modifiers to the die roll. And so... Bringing this back. And looking at our orders change. For Broken Bro, we roll the die and we get a zero, and that is going to be retain and stand. One or less is retain and stand. And that simply means that not only does he not change his orders to, to attack, he cannot move. He can, however, fire. And, well, that's what he might as well end up doing. Let's see what the terrain situation is. Here we have a shot. We're not going to bother firing at the artillery because its cohesion is 9. So unless we get some kind of a D plus result or an automatic D, we're not going to be able to uh, disorder that battery. However, if we were to, Seeing as it's the only unit in the hex, we would be able to rush up and storm it. But we weren't able to change our orders to attack, so that point is moot. So we might as well have some target practice. So we'll start here, and they will actually attempt. Whoops. fire here at the battery. 
that is at a range of three with which rifle with rifles is a negative two modifier uh firing um at artillery doesn't add anything to it it's simply uh a minus two they cannot use prep fire because rifles only get prep fire at ranges of one or or two so hmm that actually might not be a very smart shot let's have a look at the five column when you fire and take into effect or take into account that the die roll can be a maximum of seven if i roll a nine five seven would be a d plus two that might have a chance maybe if i subsequently roll high for the battery to disorder it might as well try it we'll fire get a four that becomes a two that result is d minus one they can't fail it and they can return the fire so we have three inch rifles let's find our range attenuation table again whoops three inch rifles or tbs at a range of three is a plus one and on the small arms fire also three inch rifles are not eligible for rapid fire where they could fire twice so they only get one shot and it's a plus one they are firing from the top of this uh, hillock here behind the terrain here here's the artillery battery and as we can see they are firing from a higher position So they get, oh, are they? Hang on a second. Oh, no. They're firing from the from the same elevation. So, oh, no, no, no. They're, they are firing lower. They're firing at this unit. So they get a plunging fire benefit of plus one, plus one for the weapon type at range. That's plus two. So six, six column of the small arms table and plus two those are six to eight we fire a seven plus two becomes a nine that's going to hurt so that six guns with a nine is a one and automatic disorder that did indeed hurt let's get a strength point marker so so far the confederates are taking most of the damage okay secondarily we have two units here but only seven strength points can fire out of the same hex so we're going to fire five strength points um now we're gonna we're gonna fire at this cavalry unit so again rifles at range three are a negative two a horse mounted target adds one so the final modifier is a negative one on the five table zero that's going to be a miss they have the option to fire back with uh, breech loaders and i believe they also have a negative two at range let's see here breech load carbines minus two uh minus two and then a further one because they're firing from horseback so that's a minus three well these are rather poor troops so they're going to take that shot so a minus three on the six to eight small arms they roll a five which turns into a two 
6 is d minus 1. Yeah, they could still fail that, but they don't. Now the unit underneath can fire two of its strength points, and they might as well take a poke. So 2 at range 3, minus 2, makes it minus 1 because their target is on horseback. So 2, table, minus 1, and they roll a 9. That's a good one. That turns into an 8 on the 2 table. It's a D plus 2 result. So we roll 2 plus 2 is 4. They do not fail. Uh, okay, and then this unit can only fire at the artillery. Might as well. That's all they can do. So four strength points firing at range three. That's a minus two. And they roll a zero. So nothing happens. They've already returned fire, the Union artillery, and so they cannot return fire. And that's it for Broken Bro. Uh, Archer, he's where he wants to be. So they will not activate. Pettigrew is now under attack orders, and yep, we're gonna... You know what? We're going to take a shot at capturing this battery here, seeing as the Union seem to want to retreat with the cavalry on the hill. Let's see what, what happens if we move in this direction. So this unit will announce its intention to move here. This unit will have the option to retreat. And they will hmm. They're going to have to stand because that battery is not supported. So they're going to stand. They move in and they figure what the heck. We're going to fire at them and see if we can blast them back and then, then still get to this battery. So they can fire seven strength points of rifles plus one for the weapon at range, plus one because the target is mounted, so that's a plus two. They get no uh, prepared fire bonus because they are actually moving. So seven strength points plus two. They roll a four, which becomes a six. And that is D plus two. Seven plus two is nine. That will serve to disorder that unit. But it will have a chance to fire before it is disordered because small arms fire in most instances is considered to be simultaneous. So six strength points of breach load weapons, I believe they get a plus three. They're pretty healthy. Let's have another look. Breach load carbines are indeed plus three. So they get plus three for that and plus one for a prepared fire because they were not disordered at the time of firing. That's a total of plus four, but they are mounted, so that becomes a total of plus three. Six strength points plus three. Roll to six, that becomes a nine. That's going to hurt. So six strength points with a result of nine becomes one, an automatic disorder. Ouch. So they flip and... Take 
more casualties. There you go. All right. So they are done with their movement for the turn. And they can still elect to shock if they want to. And I believe they're going to want to. So continuing the assault, we're going to move up here with Pettigrew's lead unit. And they can be seen by Buford's cavalry who decide, are we going to retreat or not? They can help possibly to, to support this unit if they decide to try and move in on their flank. But they're not going to be able to do much to stop them. So, ouch. No, they're going to try to retreat. And, and they have to make a UDD 8, which they pass. Just luckily, what is that? The marker, oh, inactive for two activations, okay. They move back this unit here. Uh, okay, they will not move yet. This unit goes then there. No reaction from the Union cavalry, and they're they're going to just try and oh, wait a minute. Yeah, they're going to go right in here. They're tired of messing around, and they've got designs on getting that Union battery. Um, more chances for. Union to withdraw. Let's hide that for a second. And hmm. uh, down a steep slope for artillery is prohibited. Uh -huh. Okay, some uh, tactical considerations that are coming into play here are this horse artillery battery. Um, still being considered to be cavalry for reaction movement purposes, also has the option to retreat as the Confederates close in. However, if we hide the units. You can see they're on top of this steep abutment such that their only avenues of entry and exit are through these two hexes. As you can see, if they were to retreat, they have to go further away from the unit causing the retreat, in this case, this unit here. So they would have to go to this hex or this hex with Devon to be able to retreat. And they can't do that because steep hex sides are prohibited for artillery. So they are fixed in place. Confederates are now going to try to um, make use of that and exploit that situation. All right. Then we've got more Pettigrew troops here. And they're just going, we're going to see if we can just blast this road open. One. Two, again, this unit has the option to withdraw, and I believe he's going to take it at this point. And he's going to go through there, make his UDD, which he passes. Uh, the unit with Buford cannot fail. He also, he's on the other side of that hill. No problem there. So one, two, and then they're going to keep coming in here. And this unit is going to uh, 
So there, they're going to extend the line. Nope. Wrong side. That's the one I wanted. Delete that. Move that there. That costs one movement point. And then we're going to move forward as one, two. Again, these. Units have the option to retreat, but they decide not to. Now I'm going to pivot such that this unit will go there. This unit will swing to that hex off of a third movement point. Again, hmm. Treats. Oh, boy. Yeah. I think Buford is going to see the better part of Valor with this and go kind of student body out of the way. One. to make his UDD, which passes this unit. One, two, UDD, which he passes. Buford will likewise back up. He can't fail. This unit will go one, two. Oh, and that's right, he's disordered. So they've got to make their UDD and they fail. So they take a casualty. Um, let's see. Gambles, units, yeah, they're going to. Do the student body retreat, he passes this unit, has an A cohesion and can't fail, and back they go. All right. Now, the or Pettigrew is going to head into this hex to support the assault. And the reason that you usually want to have a brigadier stacked with one of his units that is going to be shocking is because if you do not, you get a negative one modifier for not having a brigadier participate in any of the shocks. And the other reason is that Pettigrew, as you can see, has an A for aggressive. So that by itself adds a plus one to the assault. So they will declare a shock and where is it? They will declare a shock. Now because one of the units fired on the way in, this disordered unit here, the Attack cannot be a infantry charge, which if all of the units involved in that shock only move to contact and they have to move at least one hex, they can't have begun adjacent, they can declare an infantry attack and they get a plus one bonus. However, because one of the units fired, that goes by the way. All right, so we have a total of 
28 strength points attacking six for the Union. And I don't know about you, but those do not sound like uh, good odds for the Union. They will almost assuredly be swept away. And the other thing is, if the result is bad enough and the Confederates get a continued shock out of it, this unit will be forced back, possibly route, and then they will get to move in on the flanks of this unattended artillery battery and probably take it. No, assuredly take it. So, because there's no chance for them to survive the onslaught, the Union Cavalry is going to elect to retreat. Retreat before shock. And they do that by moving one hex out of the way and farther away from the assailants, which they do. And then they roll a UDD against the five cohesion. And let's see, do cavalry get any kind of a cohesion bonus for shock when they are mounted? Let me find my shock tables, shock adjustments. This is the pre shock. Oh, there they are. Pre shock Union DRMs, cavalry charging. Um, no, that happens at the end. So they don't get any bonuses. So they have a five cohesion. They make their UDD. And with a zero, they pass it easily. The Confederates get the chance to advance. And they will do so with the larger unit, leaving Pettigrew behind with the disordered unit and a little bit of a buffer. And that is the end of the shock. And also the end of the division's movement. So we will now move Heath here and draw another chit. And we get Heath again. This will be a third activation for him, which would make it um, a fatigue incurring one. And let's see. Oh, hang on a second. I did not move Davis's brigade. So let's backtrack. Uh, they have to sit out one. And that next one that's actually upcoming is the one that they can sit out. So they actually would have moved uh, in the previous activation. One, two, three. And one, two, three, two, three. Davis will move here. And Heath himself is going to be a little more consolidated. So let's move Heath here. One, two, three, four, so that now Broken Bro will be in command at the end of the turn. Okay, that's what happened last activation. Now, Heath has again been activated, so he's got choices to make about um, whether to incur fatigue. Davis is going to sit out this activation because he is out of command. We already know Archer is not going to do anything. Broken Bro... Hmm. Boy. 
he doesn't need any additional problems. So what we're going to do is not have them activate, but we'll move Broken Bro in in an attempt to rally. This does not incur fatigue. Oh, man. His cohesion is two. Broken Bro reduces the die roll by one, but five. So five minus one is four, which is still twice his cohesion. So not only does he fail to rally, but because the die roll for the UDD and the rally attempt is twice or more what his current cohesion is, he has, oops, where is it? 50 guys decide, well, maybe I got better things to do today, and they incur stragglers. That's not good. All right, Pettigrew, he's going to incur the fatigue. Oops. We're going to clone this because we know that they will only now have okay fatigue. Rather than zero. So Pettigrew is going to keep the assault going. Um, let's see. Uh, when they advance into that hex, they, the artillery could have elected to change its facing. And seeing what's coming, that's what they're going to do. Okay. So Pettigrew is going to... See how much more of a toll he can exact here. Um, they're going to try and get get right into Buford here. We know this unit here is probably gonna, probably everybody's going to start to back up, and they're going to pretty much abandon that artillery to its fate. Um. So let's let's start to ease on down the road. They're going to change their facing. They're going to get into extended line, shake that out. That costs one movement point. One. And then they're going to march on mass. Two. This unit now has the option to uh, retreat, which I believe he will take. Oh, let's check the orchard. That costs Manly Cavalry two. So that retreat is actually going to. Ooh, that's going to complicate. the UDD, and they're going to have to add two to the roll because they're going to retreat through two orchard hexes, which cost plus two to the normal cost to retreat through. Um, or, hmm. no, he's only going to retreat the one hex. Get a plus one on his UDD, which is a six. And again, that's going to cost him a strength point. He's moved two, one to shake out the line, one to move forward. Or no. No, he just shook out the line, so that is one strength point. There's two, 
they the entire line has another opportunity to continue the retreat and what are they going to do oof all right they're going to they're going to try to retreat through two hexes there. The stream costs mounted cavalry plus one. The orchard is plus one, so plus two to his UDD. Oh, and they disorder. Wow. Okay. Um, who else is going to be with treating, retreating? Uh, double day. Let's see if there's. Whoops. Let's... They're behind there. One. Two. They don't have to retreat, but then these this unit will have to keep going through them. But with Buford there, they can't fail. Um. Gamble can see that there's no way they'll be able to get to him. So he'll stay there. This hapless unit here is not going to try to retreat again. Oof. But they know what that means. Now this unit is going to... Notes unit is for Buford. They're going to move adjacent here. Oh boy. Now, though, they will do their retreat as retreat before melee or retreat before shock rather than as reaction. They're going to have to take their lumps. Um, this, however, would be an infantry charge. Oh, I guess we have separate infantry charge markers. Come on, let's go. Ah, yeah. Okay. And finally, this unit is going to come pouring over the hill. One, two. Now Gamble's got to decide whether or not to do a student body to the rear, and he will, has to keep going through that unit, but because of the command that is there, they cannot fail their UDDs and retreat in good order. And this unit will move there for its third movement point. Uh, Okay, that's where they'll go. They will now also declare a shock attack against this unit and against the artillery by that unit there. Pettigrew will try to rally unit under him yes and they will forego any bonuses and penalties for not having the brigadier involved in the combat and they will try to use his star to try and rally this unit five cohesion minus one to the die roll is a five so that unit rallies Oops, back to good order.
There we go. All right. So because Pettigrew stayed behind to do this rally, all of these shocks will suffer a negative one uh, if if they end up going all the way through all of the different shock phases to the end, they will suffer a negative one. But with the numbers of troops that they have involved, yeah, the Confederates would not care to get a negative one. Okay, so we declare the shock targets. Hello, Blue Tweezers. Uh, 10 minutes late, but I'm acknowledging your presence. Glad to have you. All right. So um, we have retreat before shock. So first off, artillery are not eligible. And because of the butte behind it, they can't retreat anyway. So they're, they're pretty much in trouble. The cavalry unit there has six strength points against the 17 that they will provide. And if they retreat, the only chance they really have is if their combined fire manages to drive this Goliath unit back before shock and with the artillery here six guns firing in their face ooh i'm wondering if those sheer cliffs might prevent them from firing let me have a look at that steep slope um Artillery may not target an adjacent unit across a steep slope hex side. That is not good. So the artillery will not be able to fire anyway. Steep slope, fire K, yep. So they are in trouble. Um, goodness. Well, I have now learned why that is not a particularly good position. Um, the unit is going to... Hmm, they're going to attempt to stay there and help out what little they can. So they will elect to stay. This unit here... Oh, boy. They are going to elect to retreat. And then they will roll. And they actually pass their UDD with a 5. If they had stayed, they would get a plus 1 because of the fact that they were already disordered. And so then they would have failed. Okay. So the... Union troops are going to move in to occupy that hex, and that ends that shock. These units are going to attempt to stay. This unit will have a plus one to its die roll because of the fact that they are already disordered. And they roll a five. So they do manage to stay. The artillery um, can't fail because they have a nine. But they can't fire either because of the terrain. All they will do is add one strength point to the manpower total because artillery in shock lend one strength point to a shock defense for every four guns with the anything rounded uh, anything left over uh, s chewed so 
this unit passed, and so they get um, pre-shock fire on this unit as they charge in. So they have, they still have all six of their strength points. They're breech-loaded carbines. So that's a plus three for that. Minus one for disorder. Minus one for firing on horseback. And that's all they get. So it's a total of a plus one. They roll a two. That becomes a three on the six column. Six turned into a three is a D minus one. That unit has a A cohesion and thus cannot fail. So the, the fire has no effect. The artillery, as I said, is fronted by a steep hex side. Oh, no, they are not. They actually do get a chance of fire. Okay. I misspoke. So we have six guns for three-inch rifles, and I believe that's going to be plus three. Let's check that. And we get TB rifles, range one is plus three. They wish they'd be able to do rapid fire, but alas, they don't get that. So a plus three. Um, it's a gradual slope. A large target, but they don't get that for canister fire. Do they get downhill? Yes. So plus four on the six table total. Okay, let's move that over here. Six on the small arms table, plus four. Eight. Oh, this is really going to hurt. Eight and four becomes a 12. Two, an automatic disorder. Wow. That was a big blast of canister directly to the face. So let us decrease till we get to, uh, well, it's 15. Markers don't even go far enough to describe this unit, but we know that it is 15 strength points, and he's also disordered, obviously. Let's see if that helps to save the guns. So after the defensive fire, then the attack actually goes through. So we have 15, 15 strength points to 7 for the Union. That's six for the for the horsemen and one for the crews of the guns. So fifteen to seven is just over two to one odds. That adds plus two uh, for the Confederates. Let's get the tables up and run through all of the modifiers that may or may not apply to the shock. And here are the shock adjustments. Both sides have a, a unit that is disordered, so that is a wash. We have a cavalry unit that is... Hmm, okay. Let's see. Pro defender, no. Pro attacker, there's no charge because they started the phase adjacent. They didn't move up, so they don't get that. Uh, it's a frontal assault, so they get no positional modifiers. They have no brigadier. Remember, they left Pettigrew behind to do rally, so that's a minus one. So coupled with the manpower advantage, which was plus two, we're at a total of plus one for the attack. Um, the terrain, they are going up a 
steep slope. And the effect on shock is minus two. So now this attack has suddenly become a minus one total modifier. Wow. That is very interesting. Okay. Windows is complaining about my throughput, but all right. So the attack comes in at a minus one. We roll the die. Oh no, that's amazing. We get a zero. We get attacker retreats. So the attacker has to retreat one hex and is disordered. Since that unit is already disordered, he has to roll for a second disorder. If he passes, he will lose the strength point and retreat one or two more hexes at his discretion. If he fails, he will route. So we hold our breath and we roll and we get a four. He passes the second UDD. So now he is, in fact, at 14 or 17. He's already lost one for 16. He's now at 15. My goodness. I'm going to stack this with him so that we don't forget where he is. He's at 15 now. And he retreats two more hexes. The attacker has the option, at least for the cavalry, to advance into the hex and to launch a counterattack. But seeing as there are a lot of men still in that hex, they're not going to do that. Now, since that is the end of the shock, the attacker has to undergo post-shock disorder in which they, if they are not already disordered by the shock itself, they become disordered. If they are already disordered, which is the case here, they lose an additional strength point to stragglers. And so we will delete that. So that's been expensive. This unit has lost three strength points. There. Okay. Wow, the Confederates are not having much luck with their initial attack. They really should have just stormed that battery and just taken it. But such is the vagaries of love and war, right? It's never fair. So we will bring the Confederate one there, and Mark Heath as having used his third activation, and we pick yet another one, and we get Double Day. And, and for Double Day, he's going to have four, as we learned earlier. First, I will remove the moved markers there. I'm seeing a comment from uh, Blue Tweezers. Yes, that is indeed a steep slope. Oh, th yeah, that, that one particular face was not steep, yes. So I did later figure that out. Um, so now we're back here with... Who's that division commander? I keep forgetting his name. Uh, Doubleday. Yes, here's Doubleday. Here are his troops, and he has used, I believe, two activations. So a third will incur him fatigue. And the situation here with Buford Cavalry has gotten oof, mildly precarious. So might be good for them to use fatigue, go to okay. 
fatigue. Let's clone this. I'll just plop it over there. And let's see, we're going to move. They can't enter the best blocking position because Buford's cavalry then would, well, they could probably go out this way so they can kind of exchange places. I believe that's what they're going to do. Okay, so one, two, three, the stream costing one. Four, five, six, there, units behind, one, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six, and voila. We have a blocking position that's ahead of McPherson's Ridge, which is here. Got our artillery on the high ground behind us, which will help after Buford's cavalry get out of the way. We've got Cutler here. Okay. Hmm. Cutler would probably do the most good on this front here. So we're going to try and do this. And I realized that I didn't do all the facing stuff to do that by the book, but you can kind of see what I'm getting at here. Okay, put Cutler there. Okay, that's good. These guys are, oh wait, I'm moving the wrong division. Sorry about that, I moved the wrong division. These are Wadsworth's guys. Let's mark them as unmoved. And let's just move Stone, which is the other division there. Let's see if we can't set ourselves into position here to launch a counterattack. I'm going to watch here and see. Yeah. If he's gotten too far out in front there, we could maybe launch an attack against uh, Davis and Pettigrew as they try to move down the road. So let's let's see what we can do to make that happen. Um, two, four. Let's not get too carried away, though. One, two, three, 
whoops, I meant to go there, three, five, There, move stone there. Let's see, rally will go there. Okay. And that's double day. Double day moves a third. And these guys also incur fatigue, so I'm going to clone the OK marker here. Artillery, obviously, do not incur fatigue. Um, but they may, oh, wait, they are attached to Wadsworth's division, so they don't get to activate here. And that's it. OK. And check my notes. Right. OK. Everything's good. And finally, the last activation of the turn, and it is also double day. Um, he's going to let that go because he doesn't want to pile on fatigue. And that's the end of the activation segment. Now we have the leader movement segment where all the core commanders and later army commanders get to do their movement. If you've been following along, you also know that these leaders can move up to, they kind of have a march movement type of procedure. So they can move up to four activations, which would represent 40 strength points worth of movement during this entire phase. However, if they use more than 10, then whatever radius they have for their command, as you can see, AP Hill here has radius of seven, that radius is reduced to zero, or he can only have an effect in the upcoming turn uh, with any leader or units that he is stacked with. So you have to keep that in mind. All right, let's uh, let's do the Confederate leader movement first. So we have AP Hill here with a radius of seven. What he's going to want to do is make sure that Heath's division under him is within his command radius, and also that Pender, who is here, are within that radius. And that is eas easily accomplished by simply staying on the Chambersburg Pike. Um, after that, if there would be a way for him to be able to use his three stars to good effect, that might be good too. Um, if he moves up here with Heath, that might subject him to fire should a infantry unit move into that hex. So we're not going to attempt fate. We're going to leave AP Hill exactly where he is. Moving to the Union side, our core commander is Reynolds, and he's got now three, three divisions under, no, just still the two. We have Wadsworth's division here, and we have Doubleday's division here. So he wants to try to keep them within uh, range if he can. And also, the well, no, the artillery here is under Wadsworth. So let's have a look at what we got. So we got Wadsworth here, who has a range of five and has kind of decided to let Meredith fend for himself. He is here with a, with a range of five, and hmm, that's going to leave Wadsworth and Doubleday. Reynolds is going to want to move to a position where he can keep both Wadsworth and Doubleday in command. 
So that means he should be somewhere here. Maybe keeping his unit in the unfinished railroad cut or on the embankments there. So let's go. Here, the one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, eight nine. Yeah. He's going to take up headquarters there. So that puts Doubleday within his radius and Wadsworth. And also these units in March. So they're coming up the road here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Hmm, it's not quite close enough for them being in March orders. So Robinson will have to kind of fend for himself unless I can find a position where he would be close enough to Robinson. Let's see. One, two, three, four. If Reynolds were there, Doubleday would still be in command, but would Doubleday? His radius is only six. So if he were there, one, two, three, four, five, six. How about if he were there? One, two, three, four, five, six. Still one more. If he were here, one, two, three, four, five, six. Wadsworth would be in command from here. How about, let's see, the railroad itself. It's only one. One, two, three, four, five, six. No. No, not going to be able to to get Robinson in command, so there's as good as any. There's our leader movement and the end of the turn. Now at this point, both sides would reveal their core's efficiency to make sure everything is on the up and up. As we can see, AP Hill had a three, and that explains why Pender got a four, because A.P. Hill himself, being on map, adds one. And we saw that Reynolds has a four, which explains the embarrassment of riches there, and Buford's cavalry there had a two, and he adds a third, because he is an able commander on his own initiative. So there we have all of that. We'll take all of the expended chits and plop them down here for use in the next turn's activation segment. We will send the Efficiency chits back to the stack here. Stow that. Do the same for the Confederates. We'll return that to the stack. Move Heath's division and Pender's division. Over here, I've just stashed all of these here so that we can easily drop them into the hat when we need to. And that's all for the turn. So we go to the turn record and we move the time to 12 o'clock. And this looks like as good a time as any to end this telecast, and who knows, maybe we'll come back and move into 12 o'clock when the Confederates start to get some reinforcements here to the western side of Oak Hill. We will then continue with the, hopefully, the extraction 
Buford's cavalry minus any more casualties to the rear and maybe even save this gun battery. So a lot of gravity is going to uh, probably hinge on who wins initiative and who gets to move first. All right, so that's it for this turn. Um, well, let's do another look at the overview here and see what we can show you. Okay, so as the well, as Confederates move down the road, we see that Heath is having some success with the attack overall, but at a cost. Pettigrew has gotten this large unit whacked pretty good. He's got one uh, brigade here that's going to uh, try to enter reserve for the next turn. But right behind Heath, we have Pender's Brigade, which at its option could continue down the road and support Heath, or it can start to move down here and pressure the Union, who seem to have a pretty good position here with forces behind Hers Ridge and forward of the McPherson Ridge position with even more troops to emerge out of Gettysburg next turn. So we still have a lot to fight for. Um, neither side really, ne yeah, let me say that again. Neither side seems to have a huge advantage at this point. They both have both positives and negatives in their relative positions. So we'll just have to see what happens as the day goes to noon. So I'm going to stop here, and hopefully I'll see you in the next telecast when we move forward. Until then, this has been Alan Dickerson with Stiegler for the details.